Hi Scott, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Welcome to my humble abode. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it here. Oh, thanks. Um, we have been friends for many years now. In fact, I count you among my oldest friends in Nova Scotia. I think so. I think I met you through my cousin Catherine at a Christmas party. Yes, yes, yes. I think it was like a house party or a Christmas party. And I think even back then we uh, struck up a conversation and it was about St. Margaret's Bay. Probably. I, I love St. Margaret's Bay. I love Nova Scotia and um, I, I just love telling people about about the beautiful place that we live in and the history and yes, just love it. I know I had a lot of questions for you regarding the history of okay. St. Margaret's Bay and I was just getting started in those days. I even didn't know that you know one day I would write a book that set in St. Margaret's Bay. Ah, oh, it's this one. Yes. Mickey and the Lost Templar. So I feel like you're the right person to interview about the natural beauty of St. Margaret's Bay, the attractions there, and its long history. Oh, thank you. I, I hope I do it justice. <laughs> Great. I know that you are a teacher. Yes. And that you own and operate a club for children called uh, the Indian Point Young Naturalist Club. Yes, it's a, the um, unfriendly acronym is IPYNC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, most of people, friends to Scott, Scott Camp, campers call it Scott's Camp. Scott's Camp. And uh, this will be okay. my 16th year of running the camps, yeah. So you've had it for 16 years? 16 years, yes. I, I, um, I worked at the Museum of Natural History in Halifax mm -hmm. and I became a teacher. Um, and then um, as a teacher, as a substitute teacher, you finally have summers off. Or, and when I worked at the museum, I worked in the summers. And becoming a teacher and working at the museum and meeting archaeologists and geologists and biologists, I just took in so much information being a naturalist there, mm -hmm. learning so much, so many things about um, the beautiful place I lived around, which was St. Margaret's Bay. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, you know what? I love to share this with others. I'm, um, I'm into photography because I want to share it with others. I love into knowledge because I just love to share it with others. And I love tide pools and I love sea creatures. It always fascinated me when I was a kid. I spent hours looking at creatures and finding them, but I didn't really know a lot about their natural history or about too much about them. I just thought they were really cool. So this way I got to um, learn about them myself and then tell other people about them uh, through my camp. So it was a great thing to me and uh, hopefully to the kids too. That, that, that's wonderful that you feel the need to, to teach and share and instill your love for yeah. Mother Nature. In yeah, yeah exactly. I love it, and uh, I want to go on nature walks with everybody. I go, okay, I'm going to talk a lot about things, but <laughs> if you find I'm talking too much, you can just tell me to just, you know, be quiet. I will. I'll try. So, yeah. Well, and I think that last year you participated in a bit of a dangerous ocean adventure. Uh, last year in an uh, uh, ocean adventure? Well, I, um, if you mean uh, looking for great white sharks yes. off um, the La Haye River. Mm -hmm. Yes, it wasn't very dangerous. It was like um, about uh, a kilometer and a half off of the La Haye River. And um, it was a big ship called the O-Search. And it had a basketball hoop. And basically it was a beautiful day like today. Uh, it's out and we played basketball waiting for uh, people offshore in another smaller boat to catch a great white shark. Did so, you catch one? Well, um, throughout the day it was really interesting. We saw giant ocean sunfish, the largest bony fish in the world. We saw the fastest fish in the world, uh, bluefin tuna, all swim by the boat because we're just in this one position on this big ship and we have the whole expanse of the ocean to look at and uh, we saw these interesting fish called Atlantic Surrey and we got to intermingle with all these scientists from the United States, aquariums, Georgia Aquarium, and we got to hear what they had to say about sharks and nature and I actually, I felt really good, humble me, they pulled up the Atlantic Surrey fish which is a strange beak look, look uh, so it has a beak on it and they're kind of uh, blue color and they didn't know what it was. And I told them what they were. I told a bunch of scientists what kind of fish it was and uh, it was great. And I got a picture of a bluefin tuna jumping in the water and all the scientists wanted me to share it with them. Anyway, we were having so much fun and I had kids from my camps there. I forgot why we were out there. But all of a sudden, <laughs> a big like sound goes, Okay, scientists to the stations and guests to the top of the of the ship for the observation. Oh yes, right. 
we were here for great white sharks. At that point, we were out there for six hours. It seemed like six minutes. We go running up to the top of the ship, and um, you can see the boat out there. And they slowly start bringing the shark into the side of the boat where there's a lift. And they um, be able to bring the boat through the lift and put the shark on the lift. And then they li uh, the lift comes up, the water goes out, and the shark's sitting on the deck. But they have like um, um, like a tube in its mouth that have water throwing through their its gills with oxygen um, to keep him alive and healthy. But there's one guy named Brett. He actually jumped in the water when it was in the lift with water in it from like two or three meters with jeans on. All he had on, it jumped in with a, a shark that was like 13 feet long named Vimy. A, a great white shark. And I grew up with That's a jaws. That's great shark. So and it was eat. the most amazing spirit. There was tears coming down my eyes. Everybody was just like, oh my gosh. And it was like sometimes seeing something in real life is not as quite as exciting as seeing it on TV or how you think about it. Mm -hmm. It was more amazing. Seeing a great white shark caught in just off our shores and, and, uh, and it was this pretty guy, neat. Brett, just he just in dived in and he's the one that took the hook out of the shark's mouth and put the, um, the tube in. And then, then once the water was out, they had about 15 or 20 minutes, they had a clock going and it was a team of scientists just like op uh, doing an operation on a human all doing all these different tests and everything and then they clear and then they let the shark swim swims away and they put a satellite tag on on, on the shark and we yes. can track them all the way from here down to the Gulf of Mexico and now all these sharks that they tagged last year they tagged about 10 of them are now um, all the way up to like New Jersey and Massachusetts so and they're, uh, coming here. they're coming back again so they they actually not only mistakenly come here they're actually coming here purposely and they think it possibly could be a mating ground here as well a place where sharks mate so it's all really fascinating stuff um, wow so, and, and there's a website where people can yeah go search look up the sharks, yeah oh search right? tracking you just if you google that and I think every shark has a name they right? do they do and they they try to name them after uh, the location they were found in like there's Luna named after Lunenburg really and I was the Twitter Aww. handler for Luna for a while really? the, the, the sharks really are not actually t tweeting and okay. uh, it was pretty neat because I would tweet something and Luna would be off New Jersey and my tweet my little comment made it in the New Jersey Times about what Luna the shark said oh, so I'm, that was pretty cool I'm so going yeah. to look it up yeah on Twitter. <laughs> yeah for sure there's Nova after Nova Scotia wow yeah, so well will, yes. you, will you do this again you said you're hoping to find yeah um, they're, they're coming back in the fall okay uh, they just love it up here and um, I hope to take some of the my budding young naturalist and uh, shark so how old do you have to be to they they like, like a ten. teenager uh, oh, 10. Yeah, okay. 10. I took a 10 year old load last year. And do the parents have to come too? Um, uh, no, 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 they don't have to come. Um, if they want to come, but the problem is you can only have a certain amount of people at a time going out. So. And how did, how did the 10 year old child react? She, he, oh, he loved it. Um, oh, really? <laughs> Jasper and his, his uh, four, 13 year old sister came out as well. And I took um, those two and plus another family went. Um, uh, that was like a 14 year old, two 14 year olds and uh, like a 10 year old, another 10 year old. Uh, so I think I took a total of five or six kids out on two different trips. Because uh, you only had, can only take a two or three out at a time. Because they have other people and they've got jobs to do. And right. so it's a huge ship. I don't know why they don't take more out, but um, that's maybe what the rules are. You don't want people Probably getting in the way. Safe, but safe it's great rules. fun. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so sharks, I knew sharks were around the bays. All along. In fact, um, uh, in the movie Jaws, there's a scene, I think in Jaws 2, uh, where uh, the, uh, the mother in the story is looking at her kids playing down the sailboat and then there had been shark attacks so she was kind of worried and she picks up a book and there was a dory and it showed a bunch of fishermen falling out of the boat and a shark going through the dory of the boat. Well, guess what? Where that um, idea of that picture came from is a story from Hubbard's Nova Scotia. No about way. a shark attacking a um, a tuna a tuna boat and in Hubbard's. Uh, in Hubbard's and that's where that story came from and that picture was in the the second Jaws so I think that was kind of cool. Goodness. Yeah, and then there's a there's a long time um, mackerel fisher fisher in um, St. Margaret's Bay, Birchells, and uh, in the 1920s they caught like a 23 foot um, a shark in their nets. It died. It was dead when they 
they took it out of the nets. But at that time, it was one of the largest sharks ever found. Yeah, so and that was a white shark. They follow food, right? So wherever their food is, they will go. They, so, they so do, and there's lots of food mm -hmm. for them. Um, seals everywhere. Like in the summertime, big gray seals, like a big sandwich for them. Yeah. Well, not far from here, there's Wunnenberg and Blue Rocks. Yeah. There's a big seal colony. Yes, yeah. Near Blue Rocks. So mm. a lot of times when I go to the website to see where the sharks are, oh, yeah. they're near Blue Rocks. Oh, definitely. Blue Rocks are a great place to <laughs> hang out. Uh, so I, uh, I told you I worked at the Museum of Natural History. Yes. And on my um, breaks, I used to go up to the old library. And uh, they have amazing old books up there. And I got into archaeological accounts of... Um, uh, different things that happened in Nova Scotia with the Mi'kmaq mm -hmm. settlements and um, or Mi'kmaq sites, sites and one of them in like right in the cove I live in Indian Point they found man-eating shark teeth um, they must have used them for cutting hides or something oh my but God. they found those right in the cove so the speculation was that maybe a dead shark mm -hmm. actually washed up and they got the teeth from the from the great white or maybe they were actually actively hunting great white sharks. It would be crazy, but maybe they did that. Who knows? But mm -hmm. that was, you know, like 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. So, you know, they had giant shark teeth. So. And they used those teeth as a tool for a Probably. That's what I'm thinking. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, big shark teeth. So it's kind of fun. If people want to join, if they want to send their children to your club how do they do that yeah just contact me or go to my uh blog site in indian point young naturalist club yes. blog site blog i don't know where the name blog comes from but it's my me blog neither. site <laughs> um yeah so you can get a hold of me that way or mm -hmm. um if you just put in scott pelton indian point young naturalist club or even scott pelton nova scotia it comes up uh right on so um you can right contact on. me that way and mm -hmm. um i do four camps a year and three camps are for like five to uh, 12 year olds and my fourth camp is uh, for the big kids I call them uh, for 12 to 15 year olds and uh, we actually do a lot of citizen science programs with the older groups we have an artificial reef now um, at the end of my boathouse in about three meters of water it's a color reef ball and uh, we use iNaturalist uh, to actually document the different creatures found on it and every one of the kids in the older camp gets a, an actual Department of Fisheries fish license for crabbing and they uh, uh, they lend us crab traps and we catch green crabs by the hundreds sometimes and uh, we uh, document them and collect data on them. They're an invasive species meaning they came from somewhere else. So they love it. We have fun. We make it a contest so you know the winning team gets a whole box of some more for themselves. So they're very competitive and they'll have different teams and different spots where they have their traps and it's all, all lots of fun. Yeah. So the club sounds quite epic. It is an epic. I mean, this, this year it's a little going to be different because of, um, you know, the COVID and, mm -hmm. and everything. So we've uh, now, uh, we're cutting the numbers and oh. uh, having two separate groups per camp. So okay. one group will be down by the water. The other group will be up towards the camp where I live. And um, at lunchtime, after lunch, we switch. So the group that was down the shore comes up, mm -hmm. runs up, goes down, and that's the only way we can do it with the rules. But we're one of the few camps on, so everybody's really excited about that, mm -hmm. um, that we can do it. So the place where you live, Indian Point, mm -hmm. how did it get its name? Well, you know, that's a good question because um, living there as a kid, I never really thought about why it was called Indian Point until one day my cousin showed me a big treasure chest and it was a treasure chest full of um artifacts that he's collected over the years he was about t he's 10 years older than me so he was you know he was like uh i was seven and he was like 17 <laughs> uh, or something so it was like wow this is amazing and he had arrowheads and um uh, copper beads and trinkets and everything so it was just amazing and he he uh, actually ended up giving that to a gentleman at St. Mary's University, his stuff oh, eventually, most of it. the right thing to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the wrong thing to do, though, was to actually take it out of the ground because uh, archaeologists um, find out a lot from just um, where it's found. Right. So you're taking it out of, situ, out of the situation. Yes. And that tells a story on its own. A, a, a trained archaeologist can tell a lot by where it's mm -hmm. just located, you know? It right, is, because they can even get pollen out of... Oh the yeah, ground, yes. and then try to date the pollen, exactly right? yeah. So. But if you disturb it, then that's so it's it's gone. not 
uh, considered a good thing to do now, but this was years ago. Um, um, so, yeah, so anyway, he really fascinated me uh, uh, showing me this, and um, I got to see arrowheads, and I, um, it was really cool. And he collected them from around Indian Point, where, where mm. the name got its name. Uh, Maybe that's where the Mi'kmaq people dwell. Yes, at yes. Indian Point. I, I know yeah. that I read somewhere that they would come down to the shore in the summertime yeah. to fish and to live, and then in the winter they would head back. Exactly. To, this was their summer. Oh, the big game. They were summer home, and I can imagine. I always dream. I actually still dream, and I, I literally had dreams about what it was like before Europeans came over and you know chopped down all the trees and put potato fields and took all the fish. Um, what it would look like, and you know salmon and bluefin tuna jumping, the the biodiversity would be just incredible. Like it'd be the rival any national park in the world right now. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that's gone, but we still have a lot of it, and we hold on to it. Like seeing a, a bluefin tuna as big as a car jump in front of you, it's like you you first think, oh that's not real, that can't be real, because that's a giant mackerel. You're basically just you know seeing a giant mackerel jump right out of the water, I think, or seeing a uh, uh, I was over to Tan Cook Island today, and 10 years ago, I was going to Tan Cook Island, and I saw a leatherback turtle. Um, oh, they are huge. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, the head, I only, I only saw the head part, turtle. but it was like big as a, a basketball going through the water. Uh, Aren't they really... as large as a person? Oh, they're larger, yes. Larger yeah. than an adult? Many thousands of pounds, yeah. And they eat jellyfish. They eat jellyfish. They eat jellyfish, yeah. They probably have a lot of those, right? Uh, we have lots of jellyfish and you know so they'd like to come in this time of year and they migrate and they track them they have trackers on on uh, sea turtles mm -hmm. yeah wow that's pretty fun and near indian point is a very magical island called makus island i really wanted to ask you about makus island yeah, it's a really special spot. I, I grew up going over there with my my family as a kid, mm -hmm. and uh, we just considered it kind of like our island. But a family called the Macoos, who who uh, had owned it since the 1920s, they they're from Massachusetts, and they came up every summer. Mm -hmm. But they just loved having people visit if they respected the island. The lo that, local people. Yeah, the local people going, you know, because mostly this is local people and cottagers like myself when I came down there. So everyone kind of respected it. And it was, I never even thought of it as a private island, even though it was. But these people were, I guess, really nice enough to be able just to let us kind of use it and use the beach. And so we used to go over there and my sister would take me through the woods and go see the seals on the other side of the, uh, of the island and toads on, on the beach. I remember little toads jumping around everywhere, little things like that. And, you know, um, so it just, I grew up that way and then bringing my friends over when I was older and campfires and then um and then you know just recently i uh, with my camps i bring the kids over there do tide pool tours mm -hmm. and amazing races island amazing races it's just wonderful but i never really thought about the history of it until i started with the st margaret's Bay stewardship association mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh I wrote which a, is a nature yeah a nature, exactly they you know um conservation and protection of the island and then now they actually own the house on the island and they lease it from the uh, Department of Lands and Forestry, um, and in exchange for taking care of the island and making sure it's kept um, the way it is, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it used to be called Big Indian Island, and before the 1920s, until the Macoos took it over, and then they just referred to it as Macoos mm -hmm. Island because that's who lived there. Mm -hmm. And then the island off it is called Little Indian Island, but some people call it Sheep Island because sheep used to be on the island. I have a um, He's kind of like a distant cousin. His name is uh, Cliff Dauphiny, um, and uh, he's passed away now. He was in his 90s, and uh, he was raised by his uh, grandfather. So if he, he was born in, in the night, like 1914, so his grandfather was probably born in like 1830s or something. Oh, so he just to show the difference in the, the age and when he grew up. So he always referred to um, Little Indian Island as... Um, uh, Indian Lot Island, Lot Indian Lot, okay. and think Lot. Oh, like a lot of land. Lot meant grave, mm. um, so it was. Um, that's what he considered. And then when uh, I guess Cliff used to go over the island with his grandfather, he would say, "Clifford, take your hat off, show some respect," because he considered the whole <laughs> island uh, kind of like a grave site. 
So was was it and is it still a gravesite? Well, it's it it and it still uh, is. Uh, we're uh, as a stewardship, we're uh, we have to tell people, and we're not allowed to dig on that. People right. want to put a, like a, a a latrine there or a toilet. They can't do that. They can't of course, dig. Of course. And um, so so it's really interesting that way. And uh, Indian chiefs are supposedly buried on. Um, the island off of Makuz Island. So these yeah. would be the chiefs of the Mi'kmaq people. Yes, exactly. And they were traditionally buried on this island. Yes, that's what the oral tradition says. And so think of all the places that are this beautiful in Nova Scotia. Um, why would they come here? So this must have been a really, really special spot. They've done testing of sediments and oh, we was, have goosebumps. Po yeah, it was pollen and everything. And it climbed it 2000 years ago. 1500 years ago was warmer than it is now it was okay. more like Chesapeake Bay so mm -hmm. it, you just think about maybe more life in 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 in, in the bay and uh, um, the rivers running into it all the rivers uh, all, all the lakes that are at in St. Margaret's Bay now above St. Margaret's Bay head of St. Margaret's Bay mm -hmm. were actually turned into lakes with Nova Scotia power in the early 19 uh, in the twentieth century and late nineteenth century, to the lakes had yeah, to turn into a river to generate power. So they destroyed, they destroyed the lakes. Oh. Uh, sorry, destroyed the rivers to create lakes. Oh, I see. Um, and uh, dams and everything. So, mm. um, it would be very different, and um, you can see why they would think that that was a really special spot. I think. And, uh, and you said something to yeah. me before about chiefs from as far as Liverpool being brought to, to be buried on this Yes, that was, that's what I heard. The, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, an ocean-going canoes, uh, they would bring them up as far as Liverpool. That's so. a long way. That Come is on. a long way, um, but it must have been worth it. It must have been so sacred and special to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, I imagine that just the resources here, the food that they could get, mm -hmm. uh, the clams and the mm -hmm. mussels and... and uh, fish, you know, the abundance of fish was probably amazing. Like, it was just a feast, you know? I can just imagine. Yeah, like everywhere. And then on Makuz Island, the house you mentioned, it's an old farmhouse? It's a very old house. How uh, old? Are well, we it's uh, 1820s, um, okay. which is pretty old. So 200 years? 200 years, 200 years old. Oh it was, didn't originally start on Makuz Island. It was started on the mainland, and they brought it over with oxen. I guess in the night, you know, maybe the 1890s or 1900, <laughs> and the family lived there for a long time. It was like it's a bootleg family, uh, and um, I think they might be the ones that sold it to the Macoos in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot of talk of uh, ghosts, and uh, there's uh -oh. very respected people so that talk about um, ta yeah, talk Macoos? about the ghost on Macoos Island. Um, and there's something about a little girl who gives people apples? Yeah, that's a continuing story you hear about people that stay on the island, um, about a little girl who's maybe dressed like she's in like the 1860s, and she's not a mean person, not a mean kid, but they do think she's like melancholy, like she seems sad, mm -hmm. and she, she looks like she has some apples in her hand, and people have woken up the next day and seen apples at the foot of their bed or in weird places and different times of year that we don't have apples on Macoos Island. Um, because there are apple orchards on Macoos, like wild apples now, but um, so we, I don't know. And then about 10 years ago, uh, a steward on the island, who's still a steward on the island, she showed me a picture that she took with her little camera out the window in the morning and uh, 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 from the house looking down to water at the sandbar connects to the land and it looks like there's a little girl standing in the field. No way. And um, it's quite a picture. It could be hers or her aunt who took the picture. So that to me convinced me that I would never be over there uh, <laughs> after dark. <laughs> yeah. So have you, have you or have you not spent the night? On never, the no. Never. I, tell, I tell my friends, um, like I said, well, let's see, when the sun goes down at 9, I'm leaving at 8.30. Oh. Yeah. yeah, but they, they don't have any problem. Everyone, the people seem to really like staying there. Um, yeah, it's just me, maybe. Would you eat the apple? Uh, would if I eat the apple? The <laughs> apple? I don't know. I don't know what happens when you eat the apple. Uh, oh, God. But I do have to tell you a little story. Um, sure. Years ago, I did an overnight with the older kids. It was the very last day of camp. So Thursday night into Friday, we slept over. And I told them a story about the little girl that puts apples. So what I did is I did take over some apples. And, and when they were in the tents in, 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 in the night before they woke up, I put a couple apples outside their, their door. So it was really fun 
to hear them wake up and discover the apples and well, wake like, up well, their friend the like, reaction? hey, there's an apple at the door. Like, what's going on? So I, I think I did finally tell. I told them, but uh, yeah. Okay. But, uh, anyway, that's that story. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I, I do like you know, paranormal stories. I lived in a haunted house in St. Margaret's Bay myself, but that's uh, that, that's for another Oh, okay. Uh, but I never got an apple. <laughs> no, not an apple? No, no. Never, no, I never received an apple. Uh, I don't know if I would eat it or not. Maybe I would just yeah, yeah. save the seeds or something. Exactly. Plain. I don't know if I'd eat it. I'd, I'd, I'd be too busy running from the island. Or have you tested for something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Um, I've never seen a ghost myself, so... No. Um, you mentioned that uh, you worked in the Museum of Natural History yes. and uh, you worked with someone who is um, an author of this book. Yes. That's Ruth Whitehead, right? Yes, is very, that, very that nice and knowledgeable woman and uh, mm. she's an ethnologist. She studies about the Mi'kmaq culture. Yes. And um, yeah, so I remember getting that book uh, years ago when I worked at the museum mm -hmm. and I turned to one of the pages and they mentioned Indian Point. Yes. I was really excited. Yes, it's it's right here. Oh wow, okay. It's right here. This one. Ah, it's been a while since I looked Do you at that. Read from it's in, it a little bit? Sure, it's in bold print and I don't have my glasses, so I'm glad it's in bold print. Oh okay. Oh, okay. If you have any trouble. I, I, I try know. reading it. Okay. A ship taken by Mi'kmaq off Indian Point, head of St. Margaret's Bay, Mi'kmaq Island, a famous one called Elgomar Dinip whom Lone Cloud thinks was Andrew Handley Martin, a chief of Annapolis district, was once with Indians camped at Indian Point near French Village, head of St. Margaret's Bay. A Spanish ship came in and anchored, and a crew all went ashore. The Indians under the, under the above name, chief, fell onto the crew and killed every one of them. Then they took the gold out of the vessel and set it on fire in the bay, and it drifted out in flames. The gold the Indians buried in a hollow or cleft in a barren granite island close to Indian Point. Mm -hmm. But not the island at the point and not the lighthouse island, Croachers. It is said from, the Ingr said from Ingramport, a cleft can be seen in the granite rock of the island off there. Mm -hmm. So, so we have yes. Mi'kma, we have a Spanish ship, and now yeah. I want to show you a story from Blue Nose Ghosts by okay. Helen Creighton, a famous very famous folklorist. folklorist. Yes, my favorite, probably one of my most, most favorite authors. So there is a little story about a phantom ship. Oh, so can oh you, it's can a Spanish ship that? too. Right? It's, it's a, a Spanish, Spanish ship. ship, yeah. A Spanish ship used... Uh, to be seen about uh, once a year. It came up the eastern side of St. Margaret's Bay from Peggy's Cove, across from Croachers Island, then to Red Bank, and from there to Northwest Cove and out the bay. I'm familiar with all those places. <laughs> yeah. Two uh, men told that when they were out fishing and saw it, the ship was afire, and they could see men going up the rigging. Suddenly it vanished, and they had just got off over the astonishment they just got over the astonishment when it came up on the other side. Mm -hmm. There you go. Wow. So there you go. So, so we have a flaming ship. Exactly. And, and, and that's how that stories one. get changed through folklore. So this could be from like hundreds of years ago, this yes. story. But it could have been passed down to the uh, Europeans that came mm -hmm. about a ship being set afire. And the, the Mi'kmaq people lived in the area, um, you know. I think there's still the Mi'kmaq people still living in St. Yes. Margaret's Bay area. Mm -hmm. So this story could have been told to the, the Europeans that came and passed on. Yeah. And then the generation story, yeah. generation. So that could be um, a true story. Yeah, totally. Because there's so many connections to it. Yeah. But there was a mention of gold that was taken off the Spanish yes. ship. Yes. Do you think it's still out there? Ah. <laughs> I, I think it's very possible. Like, I... I they probably hit it well, okay. And a lot of people thought this probably was just stories and didn't really pursue it. Right. Uh, when I read it, I was on the phone to my friend, and we had metal detectors. We took my boat out to this island, big island, and um, we 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 tried to sadly look for it in a very sad way with a metal detector and look for <laughs> clefts in the rock. But 
we had no hope. No. And I think most people probably would be like that. Mm -hmm. Because if you had gold, if I had a, uh, 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 like a box of gold, I could ha hide it now in St. Margaret's Bay, and I'm sure you'll never find it in a million years. Oh, it's a huge place. Even if I gave you some clues, there's a lot of things very similar, and it's a huge place. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's very possible that that gold is there. Mm -hmm. It's interesting they mentioned Spanish. So, um, I, you know, um, in my history, when I grew up, I didn't hear a lot about Spanish people coming in St. Margaret's Bay. Probably not, um, no. You know, it was mostly, you know, people from Great Britain and places. So, yeah. Which brings me to my third book. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, the History of Indian Harbor by Lillian Crooks. Mm -hmm. I was actually at her book launch. Mm. Very lovely lady. Yes. I remember she had uh, the main coon cats in the cages. She, they, oh, they are really? huge. They're the really big cats that some people think are Viking cats. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's not related to history. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's interesting. <laughs> I'll say just, I just remember that. So, um, so one place in St. Margaret's Bay is called Hackett's Cove. And yes. there was a diver there, ex-military. Mm -hmm. His name was Ray Boutillier. And he used to dive all over St. Mm -hmm. Margaret's Bay. And uh, this book says that he found a Spanish pot in a sea cave in St. Margaret's Bay. And he had it dated, um, well, he took it to the archives mm. and it was revealed that the pot dated to the 1500s. It was molded in Spain and it made him believe that Spaniards visited the area many years ago. I bet. So that's the pot. I actually tried to contact Mrs. Boutillier. Yes. She told me that Ray had passed away, mm -hmm. so I was, you know, too late. Yeah. But I asked her, do you have this pot? And she says the family still owned it, but uh, she couldn't remember which box it had been hmm. put in. So I feel like it's in the attic somewhere. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> like need a to lot of that. treasures, you know, in so, in people's it, attics. Um, pots can be dated. Uh, they, can, they can tell. A professional mm -hmm. can tell. I know. Um, very quickly, the date and everything. Well, and it looks like quite a bit of it was left, right? Just the top is missing, but there is enough yeah. that, that you can probably do some Neat. dating. If, if that so was you possible. think about it, um, like the islands in St. Margaret's Bay, um, uh, you'd be very well protected if you're in a Spanish galleon, for example, behind the island from a storm. Okay. Um, they could come in in storms and, and be protected there. and. Um, so plus all the fish, and so all the fish, you can and they could come in a little farther to Indian Point, and uh, who knows the the, the Mi'kmaq people there maybe were not appreciative of them being there, and right. you could definitely see that happening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, um, they've been you know known to carry gold, so right. Um, right, it makes a lot of sense. These Spanish ships they would have come from maybe Florida or Central America. Exactly, right? and gone across. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so it, it's very reasonable and uh, it's just fascinating. I just love to be live back then or get a like a, a glimpse of what it was like back in the 1600s in St. Margaret's Bay or anywhere around here, what it would look like and mm -hmm. who was coming here and yeah. Well, and the reason why the Spanish ships would even stop in Nova Scotia was this was the last place where they could get provisions and maybe repair their ships before going to, going to Europe, right? Yeah, or Europe, yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Probably Ireland and then down mm -hmm. to England and Spain Definitely. and a lot of perils along yeah. the way, right? Exactly. Right. So, yeah, I can imagine how there is Spanish gold somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I in went, Nova Scotia. Uh, my elementary school was Duke Danville Elementary. And um, I supposedly there's a ship. They was going to Halifax or coming back from Halifax along the South Shore mm -hmm. and supposedly had gold on it from the, the Duke Dan Bell or Dan V. Yes, he, w he um, was carrying it to finance some kind of... Uh, okay. Well, um, I, I don't want to say military expedition, but I think right. France was trying to recapture Nova Scotia. From yes, oh yeah, it was going English, back and right? forth because English right. and France were kind of like the, the place that they both wanted. Right. It was a very important and, strategic and, and place. Yes, his, his whole fleet, I think, went under. Okay. So all, all that money was lost and all the lives. And, and he was on the, obviously the French side. So right. um, supposedly had gold on it too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, they mentioned one more island that I wanted to ask mm. you about, and it's Croucher's Island. Mm. So according to this book, 
on Croucher's Island, Ray Boutillier discovered two square rocks with words carved into them, but as they were in foreign language, he didn't know the origin mm -hmm. or the meaning. He found them at a time when the sea urchins were plentiful and had destroyed the kelp in the area. Today, ah. it would be almost impossible to locate those rocks due to the abundance of kelp and moss. So it sounds ah. like they're underwater. Hey, exactly. Well, that's interesting to a story I heard when I was a kid. Um, my older brother, who was like 18 years older than me, he was a scuba diver. And he told me stories about diving off Croucher's Island on the side probably where um, they might have saw the markers because it's really shallow. Um, the oh, same Croucher's Island? Off Croucher's Island There's in the water. It's very shallow. In fact, um, in the night, late 70s, early 80s, they used to have um, bluefin tuna farms there. Big corrals mm. with bluefin tuna. Okay. And uh, they used to have them off Croucher's Island and it was quite shallow there. Um, and then it got deep faster. So like water would kind of always be circulating through there but yet it was shallow enough mm -hmm. to keep the fish in a, in a small it's area. it's a great spot for diving. It's a great spot for okay. diving yeah no yeah totally and um, so my, my brother was diving there and he said he came across a cross in the water about 30 feet or about I don't know 10 meters in the water across. So so it's 10 meters deep? 10 meters deep from from I guess the shoreline. Uh, 10 meters out and t sorry not 10 meters out in, in, in 10 meters of water mm -hmm. from the shoreline um, so I could easily see um, where on the island that would be mm -hmm. it's a big bank big bank of um, dirt uh, they're called drumlins left over from the glaciers big mounds of dirt and and they and they're not rock right so water is always ocean is always pushing up against and, and ro eroding the island um, so I see it in the last 10 years how much the island has eroded like my five or ten feet so you can think of a couple hundred years ago how much more islander would have been there I so see, I so see. um it's very reasonable to think that there could be you know a land and your brother saw a cross he saw or... a cross yeah he saw not an iron he cross was... he said it was a rock cross a rock cross yeah okay yeah and um did he, he say what shape it had was it just like uh, it was a cross. A it was cross a rock or cross. Or <laughs> don't know. Did it look like this? Uh, I, don't, I have no <laughs> idea. I, I'd have to ask my brother Wayne about that. Oh, please do. Yeah. Do you think he's so, got um, photographs? That's, you know, that's, that's the, you know, as a like seven or eight year old, that kind of intrigued me. And he said, that's where Christopher Columbus came to shore. That's what he, you know, would have said. He, th said. he thought that it marked a spot where Christopher Well, Columbus that was kind of the, kind of the thing. I don't think he had any authoritative. Mm -hmm reason other than the fact that oh well, maybe that's because in our history we learned that they used to mark when they used to came to a new place they would put their flag or put their cross mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so possibly that's but i'm interesting why they would put it on an island like why not the mainland why would they put a cross well what if that's where the spanish gold is in? that's true that mark where the gold is that'd be really <laughs> obvious x marks the cross marks the spot Obvious, yeah. obvious if the cross was sticking out of water, but if it's submerged, yes. then how, how do you see it, right? Exactly. I, I don't know, but... You have um, to know what you're looking for. Yeah, and it probably even then it was on the water's edge, so it wouldn't be very obvious. Well, do you think it was visible at low tide? Maybe only at low tide they would have saw it, and so that was kind of the neat thing. And I don't know if they knew much about erosion and that, you know, 50 years from then they would still be all underwater. Yeah. So this is something that I read in an article a long time ago, and um, I don't know if it's true, but some people think that Christopher Columbus actually made a secret voyage to North America before mm -hmm. his official okay. voyage, and that he came to Nova Scotia. Okay, he scouted it out, and so when he came for the real one, he looked like, <laughs> wow, he really knows this stuff, but really he'd been there before, bouncing around and doing all this other it's, wrong things it, yeah it's possible but cool. yeah I, I i imagine that a lot of people don't know that the spaniards were cruising yeah in saint margaret's bay in the 1500s and then after them it would have been the french yes and uh, who was it that mapped saint margaret's bay in those days mm. it was uh, samuel de champlain i believe so yeah mm. I, I have a map from like 1795 that's really interesting it was put up by the R royal navy um and uh um, it's it's pretty cool and the names of the islands all different 
I would love to share that with you, actually. I'd love to yeah. see. So you have an actual printed. I did. I had it digitally, uh, digitally put on. I had made it digitally made, so it's high resolution. Oh. Um, and so, it's really cool. A friend of mine on the other side of Indian Point, his place called is called Indian Orchard, and he goes, "Oh my gosh, my parents and my grandparents had this for generations, and there's always been apple trees here, um, and a lot of them are really old and dying." And he said, maybe the, the Mi'kmaq people planted them somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. So now he refers to it as the Indian, his Indian orchard. So, so nice. there's like lots of neat things like that. Nice. And uh, the names of the islands are different. I think that uh, actually St. Marcus Bay got its name from the time of, um, or in the time of Samuel de Champlain. Yes. And he, he mapped it and they say that he named the bay after his mother, Marguerite. So the, yes. So on his maps you would see Marguerite Bay or yes. or maybe St. Marguerite's Bay. Hmm, I think possibly that map from seventeen ninety five says that too. Yeah, does I'll it say Mar Marguerite? I believe it does. I have to share that with you. But I thought it was interesting and I don't know much about oceanography back then, but right in the bottom it says low tide is at six thirty, high tides at four <laughs> like it, it like it changes every day. So why wouldn't the map what they even say it was like high tide? Like, did they think high tide was always at a certain time then? I'm not sure. But uh, well, maybe on the day when they yeah. mapped that spot. Yeah. That but it'd be really neat. 1795 um, to compare that to, to um, you know what it is today to and just see now. where, mm -hmm. like uh, the tide marks are different. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the map that they're using now, the datum they call it, um, that they use today. Um, is 1940 was the last time they actually did depth soundings in St. Margaret's Bay and they just continue to keep using that same map with different maybe navigational points on it um, all the time yeah so um, and that, yeah so, so 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 if they did it again they would probably notice that it's quite a bit shallower than it used to be mm -hmm. and you know when I worked at the museum, when the archaeologist said said that there's over five thousand shipwrecks that he knows about around no. St. Margaret's Bay, and he 5, said, 000? and he said we're not allowed to tell the public about any of them. Uh, yeah, where so, they are. Right? Yeah, where they are. Where yeah, because um, there's a special places act, and you're, they don't want people going there taking things from them. So uh, I wonder if any of the marine archaeologists study them. I would imagine they do. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think a lot of people, that wouldn't be public knowledge, a lot of it, because they, I don't, n don't know if they want people going down there. Of course, um, of course. But also the recreational diver contributes a lot too. So they need to have a little more trust maybe in mm -hmm. the recreational divers that they find things and report things. And I think there's a lot more of them than the, a lot more recreational divers and archeologists. So they can actually help each other. I find a lot rest on education Educate, educate, educate. Yes, Explain yeah. to people why something is important. Yeah. And then you're right. If you can turn the recreational divers into your allies, they mm -hmm. will help protect yeah. what's in the bay. Yeah. Like if I'm a diver myself, if I was swimming along and I found a a, a gold coin on the bottom of the ocean, what would I do? Would I just pick it up and put in my my <laughs> put it hold it in my glove and say? up go up up because i got something special or would i leave it in the place and go this is really interesting i'm going to tell an archaeologist about it so they can come down in the moment i might just pick it up but really i should just leave it there and have someone professionally kind of decide find out more about it through for where they found it would it stay there though or would it be swept away by the tide that's the thing or currents there's a lot of currents yeah right? so is it better to leave something in place and then never no one ever see it again or take it, and at least they can get some some knowledge out of it. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on, I suppose, what it is. Did you ever come across a shipwreck when you were diving? I never, never. Um, uh, I heard there was a Rolls Royce that fell off a boat <laughs> once uh, in the bay, and we kind of try to look for that. Uh, but um, wouldn't it have all rusted away? It probably would have been, but it was pretty <laughs> neat to think about it. One thing I did find a lot is um, rum bottles. Rumble. Clear, clear, big bottles, and um, uh, back in the 80s when I first started diving in the 90s, you'd always see them everywhere. You don't see as many now, but... People pick them up. Well, the rum bottles. Why was there so many rum bottles in St. Margaret's Bay? Because in the 1920s, there was a prohibition 
and uh, my great uncle was a rum runner. And, no. Uh, yeah, and he used to go <laughs> out um, in a sailing ship and meet the other sailors from Bermuda, because that's where they got it from. Bermuda. Bring it back in, um, and he had a hearst, and he used to fill his hearst up and then take it into Halifax. And, and, and no one would ever think twice in the 1920s about a hearse taking a body into Halifax for a bombing or something. So, so he'd be it totally, would not search. He yeah, no, he wouldn't be searched. Um, right. But my, my dad, uh, who's passed away, but he remembers him, uh, Al Garrison, who was a rum runner. It was his uncle, my great uncle. And um, <laughs> uh, the younger kids, which would be his, you know, still older than my dad, would actually find where Al and Garrison and the other rum runners would stash the, um, the rum on land before they came back and got it and then okay. take bottles as teenagers. Okay. And sometimes they were caught by their rum runners and they would be chased by their run, run, the rum runners um, because they had the alcohol. So all along that coast in the 1920s, uh, there was the rum running, which was kind of interesting. I yeah. think there's even a church, um, maybe in Glenhaven or Hackett's Cove. Mm -hmm. I know it has pink, it's painted kind of pink on the outside or mm -hmm. was when I last drove by it and I, I believe that they used to stash some of that rum in the basement oh, yeah. of the church. I imagine to this day there's probably places that are rum, you know, you could, that's what might be the true treasure is finding old rum bottles. Does rum age like wine? Would it be better, worth more like a hundred years later? Oh, I imagine it would be it would be worth something. Yeah, know, yeah. Just, just, it's oh, like a souvenir. Be, it would totally be neat. Yeah. So the bottles are quite big bottles. Yeah. And I um, um, used to see those all through the cove. Uh, and in my cove where I have my camps, that's I suppose where they brought it into a lot of the times on uh, Indian Point. Interesting. So, interesting. A lot of history there. Oh, for sure. Was there any piracy in St. Margaret's Bay? Was it known as a place where pirates would hide out? You know, there's, there was lots of stories. My next door neighbor swore that he had a, a stone in his yard that had a craving, uh, uh, um, marks on them that kind of indicated a Captain Kidd's treasure was there. Really? Um, but also he was a big fan of Captain Kidd. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, he was in that generation that really grew up in there. It was like yes. the Harry Potter of today. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was a little bit about that and any type, any type of scratchings you thought it was. That was kind of Captain that, Kidd's kind of that. Yes, yep. mark. Interesting off, and I just re thought of this, um, and I've heard this story a few times, and just recently by uh, someone locally on Indian Point, um, that did you see the um, um, the numbers written in the rock at the end of Indian, um, sorry, end of Makuz Island facing Little Indian Island, which is the island off, and I said no, and he said what, I, I said what does it say? He said well it doesn't say anything, it's, a, it's just a date, 1805. 1805. 1805, 1805. Interesting. And um, she goes, is that anything significant? Did something special happen in 1805? Mm -hmm. I said, not that I know of. And uh, he said, yeah, really low tides. It seems like these stories are always at really low tides or no kelp. Um, <laughs> like, well, never there. Um, but <laughs> he saw it in script it, and I think I've heard that story a few times, actually. So I, I would love to find that. That'd be really fascinating. Well, if you ever see it, take a photo. I totally like, will. Yeah, I was wondering what was happening in, in uh, St. Margaret's Bay in 1805s, early 1800s. Mm -hmm. That could have been that kind of right. interesting. And wasn't there some kind of a legend tied to Indian Harbor, which is a town yes. in St. Margaret's Bay, that the local people would lure ships onto the rocks or cliffs with lanterns and make them... Oh, crash and crash, take the loot. I just crash. read a book. I just read a book about that down in Massachusetts, um, off Cape Cod, that they, 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 they did that. Like the Jamaica, lighthouse keeper. J Jamaica in style. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, but um, you think about it, if you're into that kind of awful stuff, like if you, if, you know, if you had Big Peggy's Cove light and they knew that light, but if you like somehow turned out that light and put it down farther where there was lots of rocks, so they well, might how old get is confused. Oh, um, yeah, I, th I, I, I been there? yeah, I think it's eighteen twenties. Eighteen twenties. So yeah. anything prior to eighteen twenties, yeah. you you were on your own. Right? Yes. Yeah. If you were exactly, it might be even eighteen thirties. I'm not sure. But, okay. Uh, so that that's interesting. There's lots of stories, and um, um, it's not only like the the physically getting out there 
it's going into the archives and reading stories and accounts and yes. you know um, people who've written down information told on from generation to generation mm -hmm. and, and just like stories of that galleon you know like two stories you know um, one by Mi'kmaq elders, mm -hmm. others by a folklorist yes. in the heritage stories, and they're very similar. So yes. is that a coincidence? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, some events are so big or even shocking that yeah. people do remember them for a long time. And back then, oral tradition was, or, oral tradition was what people had. People didn't write things down exactly so they would tell each other stories and they would teach each other people talk to each stories. other more often it wasn't yes. like oh where's my ipad and we all get on <laughs> ipads and not talk to each other they loved telling those stories that was their kind of entertainment too yes and 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 to tell stories about your relatives and like i you know heard stories about their my relatives are rum runners rum runners how did it make stuff. you feel to know that somebody? Oh, I thought it was very cool. Among your ancestors, was totally cool. Was yeah. Smuggling your own. Yeah, I thought that was really neat. You, you thought know? it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like the name Rum Runner too. It's mm -hmm. a little name. Yeah. Well, very they good. were they were inventive. I used to know this young lady who one whose I think grandfather or great grandfather was a Rum Runner too, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think he lived uh, on the island called uh, Saint Pierre and Miquelon. Oh yes, yeah, Newfoundland. And he used to store the rum in the pipes or plumbing inside his okay. house. So he had like this. He had two sets of plumbing in his yes, house. Yeah. So one set of pipes was for the rum. Yeah. And the other set of pipes was for normal. Oh, actually, plumbing. not in the bottles in the in. in but actually, he had it like in his oh, mouth. <laughs> yeah. oh, that, your water is pretty strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Don't that's, hold a match to the yeah. match. <laughs> that's neat. I, I heard Al Capone had something to do with the rum running in in uh, Newfoundland. Really? Yeah, he had. Um, Newfoundland. Yeah, that, that's a long way. It is from Chicago or wherever he was. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, um, his his reach came there, so he might have got the rum that came into Newfoundland mm -hmm. into. Uh, I cover rum running in my second book, Nikki oh, and the Lost yes. Star, but it takes place in Saskatchewan where um, there's a town called Moose Jaw. Yes, I've heard that. And there's a lot of tradition there about rum running okay. and uh, other type of smuggling and tunnels that were under really? the town where they would, you know, hide people or smuggle. Yeah. So like, yeah, or I guess tunnels for for hiding and escaping. Mm -hmm. You know, emergency exit. You um, take the tunnel. <laughs> my next door neighbor, he he um, he bought his place from my grandfather. My grandfather got it from um, his uncle, who was a rum runner. Um, and so I was talking to him one day, who bought the land from my grandfather. And when he was a kid, he's dead now, but he'd be about a hundred if he was alive. Uh, when he was a teenager, he came to my grandmother and said, "Look, Mrs. Pelton, look at the beautiful car I got." <laughs> she goes, are you a rum runner? <laughs> like, because only rum runners had big cars, and I'm just looking at this one, and it, yes. she just, like, she was just totally, like, didn't like it because she thought that he was becoming a rum runner. Yeah. She so, was suspicious. Yeah, because they had the big old cars that they used to probably move the, the mm -hmm. rum with. Yeah. Well, when I was researching the history of, um, of uh, Ten Talon yes. in St. Margaret's Bay, I found a reference to Templars and I was very excited to really? see a reference to Templars. I thought, why would there be an organization called Templars, like yeah. the Knights Templar yeah, yeah. in Tantalum? But I um, was then a little disappointed when I realized that they were a temperance group. So it was not a se oh, secret yeah, brotherhood, no. it was a temperance yeah, yeah. group. So they were the anti, oh. uh, they were anti-alcohol. Right. right, yes. Right. Okay. Right. Makes so sense. They were the good wives who yeah, were trying yeah, to. Yeah. Slightly <laughs> different. Tra um, trying to persuade the men to not drink. That must be a funny conversation though. I mean, mean <laughs> interesting anyway. Yeah. Oh, I had that conversation with uh, the postmaster at the Ten Talon Post okay. Office. Yes, if you want to know anything, you got to speak to Oh, okay. To That's the postmaster. Knows, yeah, they know any, anywhere you go. They know every, everybody's mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you. Very, this is really interesting. I think I learned a lot, too. Nice. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about lighthouses. So I know there's the iconic lighthouse in Peggy's Cove yes. that everybody knows, but there's a, a very cute one further into the bay. Paddy's Head Lighthouse. On, on Paddy's Head, right. So Paddy's Head Light, I 
I know that somebody actually lived there or close by to take care of me. So the lighthouse. Yeah, it, now there's keeper. like a Patty's Head uh, historic society, and they look oh. after it. It looks beautiful now. Um, so they restored it. Yeah, they restored it. It's gorgeous. Did they buy it or adopt it or something? I think they must have just adopted the. Um, it was owned by Transportation Canada, and they just wanted to tear it down because mm -hmm. it's not being used anymore. There's no use for it now. There's like I think. Uh, a mark road in the water that's a light that he mm -hmm, used instead mm -hmm. but it's really pretty um and uh, a lot of people when i take them for boat rides it's just past a big island called um shut in island and they say oh peggy's cove it looks so different from the water side oh they think it's peggy's, they think cove? It's, peggy's cove. <laughs> it's kind of like when you go down to queensland beach and there's a couple beaches before that people think that's the beach but it's not it's the next beach down yeah. but peggy's cove is the next kind of right. inlet down mm -hmm. from from patty's head mm -hmm. so there was like um, at least a, at least two or three lighthouses. Um, Croatia's Island, which we talked about, yes. actually had a um, a big lighthouse there. In a sense, it was but like a house. It was an actual there, yeah. house that people stayed, and they tore it down in the '60s. Beautiful place. There's a book about it by um, um, the the last uh, bootlier, I think her name was, and um, it's available in the Tantalon Library, oh, okay. and it even shows a picture uh, painting of the the lighthouse and. Uh, um, oh, I wish and I it's could just have seen gorgeous it. and talks about the history and it's not a it's um kind of like a she kept a diary and she took put the diary into a book and it's quite fascinating oh i must read um, it you said they have it at the, at the town town library. library i i used to have it i can maybe lend it to you okay. and uh you know she documented events that would happen and one of them was like uh, there was a tsunami underwater uh, tsunami that came from newfoundland um when there was like off the grand banks there was like a, an avalanche underwater, oh. caused a tsunami, and actually some people died, I believe, in Newfoundland. Um, but she actually witnessed it hit, it, it had traveled all through the Atlantic Basin, and she felt it in on, on Croatia's Island. And, and she knew about the uh, the one that, you know, oh, it hit a... Newfoundland. And so it just, that connection to different um, other bigger distance. life things, bigger That's a long distance. It is a long distance. Newfoundland to Croatia's uh, Island. Yeah. And I think, um, um, early 2000s or I think Indonesia there was a giant tsunami and Halifax Harbor gauge actually measured a couple inches um, it went all the way around the world the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the tsunami mm -hmm. wave mm -hmm. like the, the, vi the vibration and energy from it so well, and but I, anyway, it's a really neat book um, you should check it out and there I might will. be some clues if you think about you know um, you know Spanish people landing mm -hmm. there she might have mentioned it might be like one paragraph Mm -hmm. It mentions about finding something strange that could fit into that. So, right. Yeah. Well, in my book, Nikki and the Lost Templar, uh, the main hero, Nikki, gets actually locked up in that little lighthouse. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, Patty's Head. It's not called Patty's Head Island in the story. I changed the name. Yes. But I based it on, on that yeah, lighthouse. Yeah, very cool. I think they say that that type of lighthouse is called Salt Shaker or. Oh, okay. Or I didn't know that, like that. expression. Just the, the yes. shape. Of it? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Are there any other places in St. Margaret's Bay that you would recommend to people if you um, talk to someone who has never been there mm -hmm. and wanted to check out the most beautiful spots in St. Margaret's mm -hmm. Bay, what, where would you send them? Um, you know, I'm always discovering special spots. <laughs> uh, but, um, you, you know, like, uh, um, uh, Cranberry Cove near Peggy's Cove is beautiful mm -hmm. and the kind of the barrens and erratics and pitcher plants and a lot of uh, coastal species of small kind of um, uh, are they the carnivores? Carn yeah 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 pitcher plants are carnivores Ooh, they attack bugs and eat them and uh, so that's kind of neat just the landscape and the erratics the rocks left over from the glaciers beautiful area but then there's like a, um, the islands in St. Margaret's Bay are quite interesting and um, there's beaches and this time of year baby gulls are being born and, and you get to see little fuzzy little uh, brown and gray um, uh, uh, seagulls hopping around and there's giant trees on in St. Margaret's Bay. There's an island called Troop Island that has like they believe three or four hundred year old uh, birch tree on the island that may be uh, from the original forest and uh, maple trees before they cut them down. Like a lot of islands all the trees were cut down and what came up the spruce spruce trees and fir trees and um, once you take away the the, uh, the canopy of trees um, the smaller trees will take over and don't let the bigger trees grow again really? so um, it's like going through a cathedral I think the expression is when you go through a big forest like that so that's called troop island 
beautiful island and uh, stewardship actually um, helps with um, a group called Nature Trust. Um, we co-steward the island and uh, so that's a beautiful island. The beaches are, oh my gosh, there's some underwater, like if you're going to go underwater, it's beautiful with all the kelps and in the summertime we get tropical fish coming in. Tropical yeah, fish? Yeah, tropical fish come off the Gulf Stream and so we're kind of known as the area where we um, get a lot of tropical fish coming in to the, to, to the coast and it warms up and it's beautiful. Um, I know St. Margaret's Bay is a popular spot for divers, so yes, uh, if yeah. you have a group of divers with you that have never been there, where would you take them for diving? Um, Patty's Head. Patty's Head? Patty's Head. <laughs> is just, it's, it's easy to get into, the water is warm, it's out quite far in the bay, so you get, a, you know, you get everything bigger out there. Um, because St. Margaret's Bay is so crowded with houses, and septic fields and probably pollution because you're not allowed eating the shellfish there anymore because of all the nutrients going in the water causing issues. It's cleaner, um, it's beautiful out there and that's Pat, one of Patty's, Patty's head. head. Yeah, yeah, the water there is beautiful. That's where I would dive. I mm -hmm. just, one of my favorite spots for sure. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And you also take photographs underwater. I do, I, I try, try my best. Yeah. Do you make calendars? Or? I do, I make calendars and um, you know, I've had a couple sea stars make my calendar and uh, lobsters and once I found a fish called, they call it Sergeant Major, it's like a, it's a tropical fish that um, looks like an angel fish. I was so excited and I, <laughs> I had my camera and I took a hundred pictures of it and I got back and they're all fuzzy because oh. I had it on um, a mode like for landscape and I should have had an underwater shot. I was so disappointed. Oh, there's a special setting? Yeah, there's a special setting on the I cameras for for cameras that can be used on in the water on the land. So um, one of these days I get a picture of a tropical fish and um, I found once a flying Gernard fish and took it in the museum and it was the first time ever found here. And uh, one of my counselors two years in a row found a, a barrel fish, which is another tropical fish that we I took him into the museum and um, his name got put down as one of the few specimens ever found. It was found by Michael. and uh, so, so you are actually contributing? To totally, you. yeah. Yes, doing that all the time. We found a crab called a ghost crab that's only found along the Gulf Coast of the United States. And I found one in the seaweed. It was Do pretty they cool. come here temporarily and then return to yeah, water? Yeah, smaller fish. Stay? Yeah, unfortunately, the smaller fish, um, they come off the Gulf Streams, like, oh, the water's so warm, I'm having lots of fun, and they don't get back home. <laughs> kind of like Finding Dory kind oh, of thing, and uh, okay. they usually succumb to in October when the water gets cold. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have tropical fish called triggerfish. Um, they're quite big, and um, they eat the barnacles when they're up here, and everyone thinks, oh, they just die when they get here. Well, they're strong swimmers. They probably, most of them make it back to uh, the Gulf Stream and find their way uh, to warmer water that way. Um, but a few of them have been found up on the beaches. Um, and what happens washed is- Washed up on the Washed beaches. up on the beaches. Well, why did they all of a sudden wash up on the beach? And people have actually seen this. The water gets really cold and they're trying to get away from the cold water. Oh, and they, and they And they, they think it's better just to go up on the beach uh, than to stay in this freezing cold water. So they- The water they, yeah. is- Cold, it does. It summer. can change over, and that's why the the bay is so nutrient filled, and so many uh, the wildlife is wonderful because the water actually inverts. Sometimes in the bay, the water can be twenty three degrees on the surface, and the ten degrees thirty feet down, and the next day it's ten degrees on the surface, and you think, oh, the water's getting really cold, but then it's twenty three the next day. That warm water has actually just kind of gone underneath the cold water. How does and, it do that? Um, well, it's more like a physics thing. It's the cold and the hot, just like how we have wind. You know, we have wind because it's like warm air trying to rush in towards the cold air. And it just kind of turns over with the way the waves um, uh, 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 channel it. And, and so it brings nutrients. It turns nutrients over. It's like mixing up a salad. And so all these nutrients and everything is all mixed up and so much life that way. So it's kind of a neat spot. So Scott, I can't really think of are, one particular spot that's the best in St. Martin's You're spot. like a walking encyclopedia. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I'm so... I can get going, I can't stop, but uh, well, thank you very I, much I, for I the interview. I love listening to you. Um, I should just mention that if anybody wants to visit St. Margaret's Bay, there aren't a whole lot of hotels on the Peggy's Cove no. side, but there is one in Indian Harbor. Yes, and, um, um, yes, it's, um, 
Clifty Cove. Clifty Cove Mattel. Clifty Cove Mattel. Mattel. Right. And uh, I know the owner. Her mm -hmm. daughter comes to my camp, and it's great. And they fixed up the places. Mm -hmm. They have outdoor fire and place for kids, and it's right on the ocean. Mm -hmm. I know Gorgeous. they have just uh, a stunning view of the bay. Yes, so yes. That's a nice place. Yeah, to no, very nice. And I think it's one of the few around there, right on the bay. There was the uh, Sea Breeze Hotel on the other side of the bay, down farther on the western side. I don't think that's open anymore. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but uh, mm -hmm. very few places mm -hmm. that you can do that. And in Peggy's Cove, does anybody offer accommodations? Oh, they do. There's um, um, bed and breakfasts. My friend Kelly Beal, okay. uh, his father owned a shop there. Mm -hmm. They closed down recently. But they own an old schoolhouse, and his dad's old place is now an Airbnb. Um, so, yeah, okay. there's places right in the cove you could go. So if people want to visit, they can actually spend a night there and Definitely. make it a longer yes. trip, longer stay. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Is There's there... camp campgrounds along there too, wayside oh, campgrounds. Oh yes, ha and, go? Uh, Oh yeah, Glen Margaret. Glen Margaret. And then there's, there's another one in, in in Hubbard's. There's a, uh, there's a there's a campground there too. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, is there anything else that you would like people to know? Either parents who have kids who would like to enroll in your camp or well, divers? I, I'm, I'm a big believer in um, uh, wanting to protect St. Margaret's Bay. Mm -hmm. So my agenda is to tell everyone about how wonderful it is and all the sea creatures that come into the bay every year. Um, and then that's why they'll want to protect it too. Because um, why would you want to protect something that you don't really know anything about that well, exactly. St. Margaret's Bay, what's so special about that? Mm -hmm. well, I want to tell them why it's so, so special, about its history, about its wildlife, in, and, and, and they'll want to protect it as well. Oh, and I do that, I get to the parents through the kids. I don't tell anyone. Shh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can see you were born to be a teacher, educator, and leader of youth, so thank you. Oh, for thank you very much. Who you are. Oh, thank you. And, um, I consider you to be an authority on St. Margaret's Bay, so... Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, um, one final story. Sure. Talking about authority. I, when I worked at the museum, I used to go on a show called Breakfast Television. Um, and then um, I was asked to bring in special um, artifacts from the museum every week, nature-related. So I'd bring in, you know, like stuffed robins. And one day I brought in a whole bunch of different eggs, Nova Scotia eggs. And I studied up in the eggs, so... The interviewer would she asked me a question about a Nova Scotia egg, I would know. As I was walking out the biologist, head biologist at the time, Andrew, said, Oh, take this one. It's beautiful. And it was like a, a blue, beautiful blue emu egg. Hey, we don't have emus here, but it's a beautiful egg. I didn't know they were blue. Yeah, well, it was blue. It was like a blue color. Didn't know that. I didn't know anything about the egg. It's a big egg. I studied about Nova Scotia eggs. So I put all the Nova Scotia eggs out, beautiful eggs, and I'm ready for every question, and <laughs> stuck that blue egg there. Well, the interviewer, Liz, she focused on that blue egg. And I didn't know too much about other than it was an emu egg. It's and I remember eyes. saying, yeah, the males lay on the nest for part of the year. And I was saying all this information, and it was just coming out, but I don't know where I was getting it from. <laughs> and the lights, the bright lights were on, and I'm like, oh my gosh. She just focused on that egg. Spot, she didn't care right? about the robin's egg. No. You didn't ask me any questions about I was that. Impressed with the, yeah, the so big, big blue one. Um, I don't know how I got on that story, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much for for interviewing me. I feel very thank very honored you. for thank you to think of me that way. So thanks. Thank you for coming, and um, I will see you at the Indian Point. Yeah, and Naturalist sure. Club. The kids are so excited. I have um, my little friend there, Kai. He just loves everything about Oak Island. And uh, I think he's written, read the books oh, about Nikki. And, uh, so I will make sure to ask Kai about his theory of Oak Island. Yes, exactly. Yes. I find that children are very opinionated. About they are. Oak and then, then yes. yeah, no, yes. exactly. Know where the treasure <laughs> might be. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, God. Thank you.